Hi, in this video I'll be taking a look at the Nano Pi M3 from Friendly Arm. With 8 cores running at 1.4 GHz, is it something that you can use? Let's find out. You might have remembered a couple of months back I ordered three different boards from Friendly Arm. The Nano PCT3, Nano Pi 2 and lastly the Nano Pi M3. Both the T3 and M3 share the same MCU, but the M3 is smaller. We'll find out later what has been compromised to reduce that footprint. So here we have it. Starting from the top right, working clockwise, we have LCD screen, two USB 2.0 headers, reset button, HDMI, one gigabit ethernet, RTC coin cell battery header, I2S audio, two proper USB 2.0 ports, headphone and mic jack, power button, or you can solder one up externally, Onboard antenna and also external antenna, DVP camera, micro USB for power, UART console, almost compatible Pi GPIO, LVDS header, and what's running the show is the 8 core 1.4 GHz Samsung MCU, GL8526 4 port USB hub, Realtek 8211E Ethernet transceiver, AP6212 Wi Fi Bluetooth module, AXP228 for controlling voltages, and 1 gig DDR3 RAM. That's about it on this side. Come on, turn it over. On the dark side, we have SD slot and audio codec, and everything else is just support components. So before we move on, I can see a few glaring issues. Micro USB for power can be an issue. You'll see later the load never went beyond 1.1 amps, but will be an issue if you are attaching power hungry USB devices. The USB hub is an odd choice. The MCU can handle two USB plus an OTG by itself. It turns out that this chip is attached to one of the USB on the MCU and the other two are left dangling. OK, whatever. They should have made better use of the AXP228, which has charging and battery management circuitry on board. The S5P6818 is an MCU designed for the mobile market and is a chip that doesn't have a long production run. Also, this MCU can get damn hot. Their website says that it has mounting holes for a heatsink but not many heat sinks will fit in that small space. This last point is important when you come to the case. Friendly Arm have released 3D print files for a case and also sell it on their website. It fits fairly snugly, but just make sure these holes line up. Then screw in the four risers, which is a bit of a bugger to do. Then chuck the lid on and Bob's your uncle. For a 3D printed case, it's one of the better ones I've seen. But heck, you'll find out later just how much heat that little bit of silicon can generate. The type of MC used on this SBC shows through when it comes to finding an OS that works. There's very little support outside of Friendly Arm. The Ambien guys aren't touching it, so you're stuck with the company's OS image. So download it and cross your fingers. Once you have it loaded up on your SD card, chuck it in, followed by keyboard and mouse, Ethernet, HDMI, and finally the juice. If you're using a bench power supply, unplug the SBC power leads first. Power on the supply, making sure the voltage is set correctly, then power off. Then plug in the SBC power leads and power on. You got it, Mick? Oh, yeah. You sure? Excellent. Applying the juice, we'll see the board boot instantly with the red going on and the green one blinking to indicate it's booting properly. Booting is fairly quick with a usable desktop in around 35 seconds. Current draw was fairly reasonable with an average of 500 milliamps and a peak of 900 milliamps. If you power off the board from the OS, it'll sit at around 19 milliamps, and you can always press the power button to boot it back up again. The bits I'm particularly interested in are the GPIOs. D-Message reported there being six GPI blocks from GPIO A to GPIO E, and also GPIO ALV. Also, SPI and ITC kernel drivers and LED access, so it's looking good so far. I normally test a board as stock without heatsinks and then test again with the biggest I have to highlight the differences. But in this case, I don't think I'll risk it. This was a temperature just after booting with no heatsink at all, quickly rising to 66 degrees. A minute later, it had risen by a further 3 degrees, and by the 8 minute mark was hitting 73. This board definitely needs at least a passive heatsink, like the small copper one I used, but I want to make sure it's been cooled as much as possible. The Friendly Arm website mentions that there are four mounting holes for a fan, but you'll need a very specific heatsink to avoid all those headers. 
Not a heck of a lot of room there. So what to do? I cut up three small bits of aluminium. Copper would have been better, but I didn't have any, so that I could mount my overkill heatsink temporarily. Just enough room to avoid the pins, and a bit of electrical tape to avoid shorting out. So I started putting heatsink compound on all the bits of aluminium, being careful to not have air bubbles, which will cause hot spots. Once done with the little bits of soft metal, I applied some goop to the MCU and chucked them on. Oh, another thing. There's a lot of talk about whether or not this goop causes cancer. Well, there's some that do, and there's some that don't. I didn't trust any text on the container saying either way, so I used gloves. Then applied some more goop to my huge heatsink and chucked it on as best I could. There you go, rock solid. <coughs> well, for my testing purposes, it was perfect. So, how well did it go? Look at that, a rock solid 32 degrees. Just to make sure, I ran through some tests that would hammer the CPU. The efficiency of this quick hack was pretty good. 8 cores being hammered saw it hit a peak of 38 degrees. That's like a summer day in Vostok, Antarctica. Well, okay, not really. 15 minutes later it had risen to 39 degrees with current holding at 1.1 amps. Half an hour later, still 39 degrees and 1.1 amps. And finally, when it had finished being hammered half an hour later, it dropped back down to 34 degrees and 500 milliamps. Nice. This SBC has an onboard power management chip, but it's a real shame it wasn't put to better use. It can support battery management and a whole swag of other cool stuff. You have full access to control this, however don't play around with it unless you know what you're doing. I write a quick script to poll the voltage levels and compare it against the schematic. Seems someone isn't being truthful here as there's several outputs being marked as NC or not connected, yet the PMIC is certainly driving them. Anyway, on to GPIO testing. This MCU has a bucket load of GPIOs, but we only have access to a small portion of them. I went through the schematic and mapped out each of the pins with alternative functions and the Linux pin assignment. I'll be doing this to all the boards I review, and you can pick them up on my website. Compared to the Pi, we have two more UARTs, three more PWM, a pulse period measurement available on the header. Oh, there's also the Alive GPIO3, which, if you read the datasheet on the MCU, allows you to push the SBC into suspend to RAM mode. Nice. I'll be testing this out in a follow-up review. Note also that this board does not have 5 volt tolerant GPIOs. Another annoying thing about this board is the fact that this MCU has a perfectly good MIPI CSI and DSI bus, but they didn't try to push this out. If they had, you could have used any of the Pi cameras. Access to all the GPIOs is easy as Pi, just be careful with the pin numbering. There's also a console UART which I attached my logic analyzer to. Sent some appropriate text and, yep, was able to see it. There's also two onboard LEDs which you can control. The blue one works, but uh, the red one is already being controlled by the kernel, so you're out of luck there. So it turns out that we have four I2C buses on the M3, with a handful of devices already present. Bus 0, we have camera, audio codec, EEPROM and the Pi GPIO. On bus 1, HDMI EDID and also the Pi GPIO second bus. On bus 2, we have touch and LVDS EDID. And on bus 3, we have the PMIC. It seems though that the GL852 USB hub isn't connected. I attached my handy dandy temperature sensor to the ITC bus 0, which appeared at address 18, and I was able to pull it without issue. Next, I wanted to test out the SPI using an ILI 9341 LCD. The FB TFT kernel driver was certainly present, but it turns out the kernel on this board is a little dodgy and I didn't have time to rebuild it for this video. On to audio. The M3 has SPDIF and I2S audio on board, provided by the ES8316 audio codec. This has some nice features such as auto level control, noise gating, 24-bit 96kHz sampling, input and output routing, and 3-band equalizer. A nice little chip. You have access to everything from the OS. The M3 has a jack for headphone and mic, so let's check it out. To test out the audio, I used a standard mobile phone headset, which has some pretty decent audio quality. There's also an onboard I2S header, which I attached an I2S audio amplifier to, and... Why? Where's the rest of the notes? Oh, sorry, right, I ran out of time for this test. Well, why did you include it? Uh, ran out of time to take it out. <sighs> oh, okay. Moving right along then, to the network tests. The M3 has a gigabit Ethernet, but unfortunately only manages to keep up with half this speed on TCP throughput. 
and UDP jitter is, well, I guess it's okay. The M3 also has Wi-Fi, so testing it out first with the onboard antenna. I saw it perform really well for TCP throughput, and also UDP jitter. Pretty good for an onboard antenna. Since there's also an external antenna connection, I chucked one on. And TCP throughput increased by around 36%. While UDP jitter stayed around the same. So Wi-Fi performs pretty well using either the onboard or external antenna. So performance time. I ran a bunch of tests over a couple of days and saw some fairly interesting results. On the C-Ray test, the M3 was almost as fast as the Jetson TK1, 2.2 times faster than the Pi 3, and leaving the others in the dust. OpenSSL tests were around the same. And likewise, so were the MAFT benchmarks. When John the Ripper started up, things changed considerably. And the small PT tests streaked ahead as well. Those 8 cores really help it along. Whilst FLAC encoding saw it drop back down to an almost level playing field. You'll be able to find all these tests that I did, plus more, on the openbenchmarking.org website. Links below, or just search for Mick Mank. They're pretty good results, aren't they, Mick? All right. Oh yeah, I prefer the orange pie over this one. Yeah, I think you're right. Yeah, and support is a real bugger. So what do I think of the NanoPi M3? It's a bit of an odd board. They obviously made some design decisions for a particular market, but I really can't figure out what that is. They had some opportunity to push out some of the more interesting GPIOs from the MCU, but they didn't do it. Also, the life expectancy of this MCU doesn't really inspire any community backing. So we're just left with the manufacturer's old OS and nothing more. However, if you need a bit of 8-core grunt, then the price is pretty attractive, and everything else works as advertised. I'd give this board a score of 3.8 out of 5, with the MCU lifespan and support letting it down greatly. Thanks for watching, and see you next week.